Welcome to our presentation about Métis history in Saskatchewan. We live in Treaty 4 territory, the original lands of the Cree, Soto bands of the Ojibwe people, Assiniboine, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and homeland of the Métis Nation. Swift Current Museum would like to thank the City of Swift Current and Sask Culture Sask Lotteries for supporting programs like this. English peddlers were mostly Scots and men from the 13 colonies, the first states. They began to deal in the fur trade. By the 1760s, the Hudson's Bay Company noticed a huge drop in the quality and number of furs coming to their posts. These traders competed with the Hudson's Bay Company, but also amongst themselves in a sometimes violent competition. A decision was made to cease the competitions and ally themselves. <clears throat> In 1774, the Northwest Company was born, made up of Montreal businessmen Simon McTavish, Isaac Todd, Benjamin and Joseph Frobisher, and James McGill. The Northwest Company trade continued north as far as Lake Athabasca and west to the Peace River country. The main advantage for the Northwesters was that they traded directly with Aboriginals, who no longer had to make the trek to Hudson Bay with their furs. They were not bound by the same rules and conventions of the Hudson's Bay Company. They used threats and intimidation when it served their purpose. They also fraternized freely with and cemented commercial ties through strategic marriage with, marriages with Aboriginals. The union of First Nations women and Scottish and French fur traders led to the birth of the Métis Nation. In 1812, Thomas Douglas, the fifth Earl of Selkirk, a co-owner of the Hudson's Bay Company, established the Red River Settlement in southern Manitoba along the main canoe routes of the Northwest Company. Acting charitably, Selkirk recruited poor settlers from Scotland to farm the land. The Métis, many of whom were Northwest Company employees, saw the Red River settlers as rivals and the settlement as a threat to their livelihood. Tensions between the two groups reached a climax when the Métis attacked the settlers in 1816 in what came to be known as the Seven Oaks Massacre. Miles MacDonald was the governor of the Red River Colony in 1814. He issued the Pemmican Proclamation, which prohibited export of pemmican from the colony for the next year. This was meant to guarantee enough supplies for the Hudson's Bay Colony, but the Northwest Company viewed it as a ploy to monopolize pemmican, which was important to the Northwest Company. The Métis did not acknowledge the authority of the Red River Settlement, and the Pemmican Proclamation was a blow to both the Métis and the Northwest Company. The Northwest Company accused the Hudson's Bay Company of unfairly monopolizing the fur trade. When MacDonnell <clears throat> resigned as governor of Red River Colony in 815, he was replaced by Robert Semple, an American businessman with no previous experience in the fur trade. Cuthbert Grant led a group of Northwest Company employees in 1816 to seize a supply of pemmican from the Hudson's Bay Company that had been stolen from the Métis. His group encountered Semple and some Hudson's Bay Company men and settlers north of Fort Douglas along the Red River at a location known as Seven Oaks, which the Métis called La Grenière or Frog Plain. The Northwest Company sent Francois Firmin Boucher to speak to Semple's men. He and Semple argued and a gunfight followed when the English tried to arrest Boucher and seize his horse. Early reports said that the Métis fired the first shot, but Royal Commissioner W.B. Coltman determined with next to certainty that it was one of Semple's men who fired first. The Métis were skilled sharpshooters and outnumbered Semple's forces by nearly three to one, and they fought off the attack, killing 21 men, including Governor Semple, while suffering only one fatality. 
the Métis forced the remaining settlers to leave, threatening a massacre. The settlers gathered their belongings the day after the battle and left, leaving the Métis in command of the settlement. Lord Selkirk tried to prosecute several members of the Northwest Company for murder, but all trials ended in acquittals and the remaining charges were dropped. Northwest Company was acquired by Hudson's Bay Company in 1821, ending the canoe expeditions from Montreal to the West. The Hudson's Bay Company gave Cuthbert Grant an annual salary in 1828 and the position of Warden of the Plains of Red River. In 1840, Métis bison hunts usually had 620 men, 650 women, 360 children, and 1,200 carts, as well as priests accompanying the group. By the mid-1850s, the decline of the bison population led to societies competing for meat, which often led to violence, especially as groups moved further west to reach the dwindling herds. By this time, eastern herds were gone. The, the Hudson's Bay Company moved its pemmican gathering stations west to ensure their supply. Métis set up winter camps known as Hivernal, farther and farther west. These settlements were active in hunting bison during the cold weather season from mid-November to mid-March, when the bison's hair was thick enough for the production of robes. The summer hunt was mainly for harvesting meat. From the 1840s to the 1870s, Métis Hivernal hunting villages were established at Turtle Mountain on the Souris River, Riding Mountain, Wood Mountain, on the Assiniboine, in the Capel Valley, on the North and South Saskatchewan Rivers, in the Cypress Hills, on the Battle River, on the Red Deer River, and in Montana. The South Branch settlements of Batoche and Saint Laurent de Grande in Saskatchewan were founded by French Métis Hivernal from the Red River settlement in Manitoba, Canada. <clears throat> Moose Jaw, Willow Bunch, Le Bret in Saskatchewan, and St. Albert, uh, Lac La Biche, Lac saint Anne in Alberta all began as Métis Hivernal settlements. <clears throat> the seeds of the 1885 resistance began as early as the 1870s, with the lack of Métis representation in the government of the Northwest Territories. Even after representation was granted in the 1880s, the Métis remained frustrated that the federal government did not address their many petitions regarding their lack of formal title to their lands and desire pr for proper political representation. The Métis desperately wanted title because they did not want to be dispossessed like they had been following the Red River resistance of 1869-70. They also wanted their land to be surveyed according to the Métis river lot system, which you can see here, uh, which provided each land over owner with riverfront. Settlers were already encroaching on Métis lands. Louis Riel was asked to return from the United States to lead a protest. His right-hand man was brilliant strategist Gabriel Dumont. In 1884, tensions between Riel and the government were arising. Charles Borromée, the Justice of the Supreme Court of the Northwest Territories and legal advisor in the Northwest Territories, sent a letter to Edgar Dudney on September 5, 1884, regarding the conditions of the Indigenous communities. Borromée wrote, Riel can harm the country and the government must come to the assistance of the Indians or misery and starvation will result. Dudney ultimately ignored this information, allowing the Métis to starve. While the Métis under Louis Riel declared a provisional government and mobilized their forces, Cree chief Big Bear was not planning any violence towards the settlers or the government. 
He wanted to unify the Cree into a political confederacy powerful enough to oppose the marginalization of Native people in Canadian society and renegotiate unjust land treaties imposed on Saskatchewan Natives in the 1860s. The Northwest Rebellion began as a peaceful protest by the Métis against the lack of government relief and the fear that their land was being claimed by settlers. On the 25th of March, 1885, Gabrielle Dumont asked Riel for permission to gather supplies for merchants at Duck Lake. Riel told a merchant to keep track of what they took. Meanwhile, Northwest Mounted Police Superintendent Leif Crozier sent men to Duck Lake for supplies. He was not aware that the Métis were there. A negotiation on March 26th led to a dispute between a First Nations man and Northwest Mounted Police volunteer guide Joe McKay, leading to McKay firing his weapon. Gabrielle Dumont's brother was killed and a battle ensued. When Superintendent Crozier heard the shot, he gave the order to fire. The Métis entered a log house while the Northwest Mounted Police had only sleighs and bushes to hide behind. They lost many men trying to rush the house and were forced to retreat after only 40 minutes. It was because of the intervention of Riel that the Métis did not pursue the Mounties with the intent of killing all of them. The Northwest Mounted Police retreated to Fort Carleton. Within two weeks, the Dominion government was able to mobilize troops. Swift Current became an important military base for the Dominion military. Its strategic location as the terminus of the Battleford Trail made it an obvious center from which the Canadian government forces could provision and direct an attack. Here you can see soldiers skirmishing on Omen Hill in Swift Current. This is a field hospital that was set up in Swift Current. This map shows the locations of the battles during the 1885 resistance. Chief Big Bear signed Treaty 6 in 1882, and his band had settled near Frog Lake, but had not yet selected a reserve site. Frustrated by what seemed to be an unfair treaty and by the dwindling bison population, Big Bear began organizing the Cree for resistance. Learning of the Métis victory at the Battle of Duck Lake a week earlier and of Poundmaker's advance on Battleford, Wandering Spirit, the war chief of Big Bear's band, began a campaign to gather arms, ammunition, and food supplies from the surrounding country, countryside. The nearest source of supplies and the first to be looted were the government stables the Hudson's Bay Company Post, and George Dill's store at Frog Lake. The Frog Lake Massacre on April 2, 1885, led by Big Bear's war chief, Wandering Spirit, was an attack on officials, clergy, and settlers in the small settlement of Frog Lake, about 55, 55 kilometers northwest of Fort Pitt. Hostages were taken and the Cree ordered the prisoners to move to their encampment a couple of kilometers away. When Indian agent Quinn refused to leave town, wandering spirit shot him in the head. In the resulting panic, despite Big Bear's attempt to stop the shooting, wandering spirit's band killed another eight unarmed settlers. Chief Big Bear was unable to stop the attack. Nine white residents of Frog Lake were killed, and the women and children were taken hostage. Indian agents and sub-agents were notoriously sadistic and cruel. They withheld food for fun, and sometimes withheld food until young girls were given to them as wives. Wandering Spirit spent 18 months in prison for assaulting um, DIA employee John Delaney. When he was incarcerated, Delaney took his girl wife. Delaney was one of the people who was killed at Frog Lake. 
Indian agent Thomas Quinn, who was the source of the inadequate rations that kept Cree in a state of near starvation, also died in the attack. Wandering Spirit was sentenced to hang for his crime. Before his execution, he said he had been told that if First Nations helped to eliminate all the white Canadians in the region, the Long Knives, Americans, would buy the land from them. The First Nations and not the Hudson's Bay Company would profit from this deal. These circumstances do not forgive the action, but they do explain his motives leading to the attack. The Cree moved on to Fort Pitt. By this time, the Canadian government had mobilized troops and increased police presence in the area. On April 15th, 200 Cree warriors descended on Fort Pitt. They intercepted a police scouting party, killing a constable, wounding another, and capturing a third. Garrison commander Francis Dickens, surrounded and outnumbered, agreed to negotiate with the attackers. Big Bear released the remaining police officers, but kept the townspeople as hostages and destroyed the fort. Six days later, Inspector Dickens and his men reached safety at Battleford. On the 24th of April, Gabrielle Dumont's men ambushed Middles Middleton's column at Fish Creek. Middleton led his force out from Capel on April 10th, and as he advanced upstream from Clark's Crossing along the South Saskatchewan River, he discovered an ambush by Gabrielle Dumont's Métis Dakota force. Dumont's scouts reported that the Canadian troops were camped near Fish Creek. On April 23rd, as the militia was advancing from Clark's Crossing, Dumont took 200 men and rode out from Batoche towards Touron's Coulee. Louis Riel accompanied them. Dumont stationed most of his men in the Coulee, where they dug rifle pits. He took 20 horsemen forward to seal the exit when the ambush was sprung. The Métis pounded Middleton's men with one devastating fusillade before withdrawing into cover and restricting themselves to sniper fire in order to conserve ammunition. Half of Middleton's force was on the opposite side of the river, where they couldn't engage in battle. Middleton's artillerymen pushed their guns to the coulee's edge to try to fire down at the concealed Métis, but they suffered heavy casualties. Dumont was outnumbered because some of his men fled the scene, but he was able to keep Métis casualties to a minimum. The only targets that the Canadians could see were horses, so they shot at them. General Middleton attempted to place himself in full view of the resistance. However, a bullet tore through his fur hat and his two aides-de-camp were both wounded by his side. Middleton, in a statement later, said, Métis plans were well arranged beforehand, and had my scouts not been well to the front, we should have been attacked in the ravine and probably wiped out. Major General Frederick Middleton had to temporarily halt his advance on Batoche. Ten of Middleton's men were killed and 45 were wounded. The Métis lost four men and 55 horses. Chief Poundmaker's people were desperately hungry. They traveled south to Battleford. Poundmaker went to the fort to re reaffirm his loyalty to the Queen, but the people of Battleford heard the reports of large numbers of Cree and Assiniboine making their way to Battleford and feared for their safety. On the night of 30th March 1885, they left the town fearing for their safety. <clears throat> they sought shelter at Fort Battleford. When Poundmaker and his party reached the town, the Indian agent refused to come out of the fort to meet with them. He kept them waiting for two days. Telegrams sent by those barricaded in the fort indicated that they believed it was an attack, but Peter Ballantyne exited the fort and acting as a spy, checked Poundmaker's plans and found his intentions peaceful. Looting of the town took place by Nakota people and Poundmaker did his best to stop it. One observer alleged most of the looting had already been done by whites. 
Poundmaker's people left the next day and established an encampment at Cutknife Hill. On April 24th, Lieutenant Colonel Otter and his men arrived at Fort Battleford. Otter decided to pursue Poundmaker and his 300 men attack the encampment. Using a limited number of men, War Chief Finday surrounded and pinned down Otter's force on an exposed plain. After six hours of fighting, Otter retreated. Poundmaker prevented an attack on the retreating troops. Eight of Otter's force died. Five or six Aboriginals were killed. Middleton's forces arrived in the Touchwood Hills. On May 9th, the Battle of Patosh began when Middleton launched an attack against 350 Métis and First Nation bunkered down in the rifle pits in front of Patosh. The malicious attack failed because Dumont's men fired mercilessly from their rifle pits. One trooper later wrote, the militia was down some distance apart from each other, firing at no nothing, making guess shots and hearing the rebel bullets zip around you and the everlasting clack as the bullets struck the trees. When Middleton pulled back his men, the Métis and First Nations advanced and shot at them incessantly. Middleton also began a frontal assault by land, <clears throat> along with what was to be a waterborne attack by the steamer Northcote. The many riflemen on the Northcote were to be put ashore behind the backs of Dumont's men. The steamboat attack failed when Dumont ordered the ferry cables lowered. The North Coat had its masts and smokestacks cut down. It drifted helplessly down the river with, with its load of captive riflemen. Having to pull back his men because of serious opposition, they built a Zareba, a pit protected by wagons in a circular formation, and that is what is showing on the slide here. On May 10th, Middleton created heavily defended gun pits and shelled the town for an entire day, but advances were prevented by Métis fire. The next day, Middleton gauged the strength of, of the defenders by dispatching a contingent of men north along the enemy's flank while simultaneously conducting a general advance along the front. Having redirected a portion of their strength to hold the northward flank, the Métis lacked the manpower to oppose the Canadian thrust, seizing ground with little resistance. Canadian soldiers ventured as far as the Batoche Cemetery before turning back. By May 12th, Métis defences were in poor shape. Three quarters of their men had either been wounded by artillery fire or were scattered and divided in the many clashes with the Canadians on the outskirts of town. They were tired and seriously low on ammunition. They resorted to hunting in the underbrush for bullets fired by government troops and firing them back, and some fired nails and rocks, forks and knives instead of bullets out of their rifles. After a failed repeat attempt at attacking on the flank and at the front, Midlanders and Royal Grenadiers moved forward to a point near the Batoche Cemetery. The Midlanders, Grenadiers and Winnipeg 90th Rifles rushed at the Métis rifle pits. The Métis were not prepared for this attack, but they resisted bravely, aided by sharpshooters firing from across the Saskatchewan River. The rest of Middleton's troops covered the flank of the charging men. The militia stormed into the village of Batoche. Métis and First Nations, who had been drawn away to the east by Middleton's feint in the morning, now appeared and commenced a heavy fire from rifle pits in brush near the village. But artillery and the Gatling gun broke this resistance. The last defenders of Batoche surrendered. Louis Riel surrendered on May 15th, and Gabrielle Dumont escaped to the United States. Within the two, with the two leaders gone, the provisional government's, government collapsed. Poundmaker surrendered on May 26th. Cree fighters and families under Big Bear held out the longest, 
fighting off Canadian troops, pursuing them in the Battle of Frenchman's Butte and the Battle of Loon Lake. Many First Nations began to abandon Big Bear as they stayed on the move. Major General Middleton sent this letter to Big Bear. Big Bear, I have utterly defeated Riel at Batoche with great loss and have made prisoners of Riel, Poundmaker, and his principal chiefs, also the two murderers of Payne and Fremont, and I expect that you will come in with your prisoners, your principal chiefs, and give up the men who have committed murders at Frog Lake. I am glad to hear that you have treated them fairly well. If you do not, I shall pursue and destroy you and your band or drive you into the woods to starve. Signed, Frederick Middleton. Chief Big Bear turned himself in to the Northwest Mounted Police at Fort Carleton in early July. Eight men, including Wandering Spirit, Little Bear Walking the Sky, Bad Arrow, Miserable Man, Iron Body, and Man Without Blood, were put on trial for the murders at Frog Lake and Battleford. They were not allowed legal counsel. Cree language did not have words for conspiracy, traitor, or rebellion, so translators had difficulty conveying the meaning of the charges. Chief One Arrow of the Willow Cree Band, who was coerced into going to Batoche, was perplexed by the translation of the charges against him. The translator told him that he was charged with knocking off the Queen's bonnet and stabbing her in the behind with a sword. One Arrow's response, are you drunk? Judge Charles Rollo sentenced each of them to hang, to death by hanging. He sentenced three others to hang as well, but their death sentences were commuted. They were hanged on November 27, 1885, in the largest mass hanging in Canada's history. Dudney wanted the hangings to be a spectacle, even though public executions had been banned in 1868. They arranged for First Nations families to come and watch. Sir John A. Macdonald said to Dudney, the executions ought to convince the red man that the white man governs. Louis Riel was charged with high treason. The government said he did maliciously and traitorously attempt and endeavor by force and arms to subvert and destroy the government of this realm. This slide shows Louis Riel addressing the jury at his trial. Riel refused to plead insanity. Even though the jury recommended mercy, he was sentenced to hang. Big Bear, front and left of center, and Poundmaker, front and right of center, were charged with treason, a word that did not exist in Cree language. Being chained and confined was, for many First Nations, a fate worse than death. Most of Big Bear's people, including his wife and its eldest son, abandoned him. His young son, Horse Ch Child, seen here in the left of the photograph, was with him at the trial. Uh, this slide shows um, an example of Métis script. The term script comes from the word description. Script were certificates issued by the federal government to Métis people several times in the history of Canada. Script was issued in two forms, land script and money script. Land was valued at $1 per acre at the time of the settlement of Western Canada. When the British Crown signed treaties with First Nations to settle land claims, they issued script to the Métis. Script certificates in the form of land script and money script were used. Script represents a cash value for goods. 
Land scrip was issued in denominations of 80 acres, 160 acres, or 240 acres, depending on time of issuance. It was issued to the head of a family, similar to the 128 acres per person issued to First Nation people under the treaty negotiations process. Money script did not require a person's name. The pay to the order section merely stated pay to the bearer upon demand. This format was very transferable and recognized as cash. Most script issued to Métis people um, did not do what was intended for the Métis community. Land speculators, lawyers, storekeepers, bankers, government officials, and others conspired to undervalue and short value the script certificates. The biggest problem with land scrip was that the land they were entitled to was not the land they lived on. The land was not surveyed to accommodate the traditional Métis river lots, which provided each resident with a bit of waterfront. If they were not satisfied with the land offer, they were offered money scrip in exchange, and it could be used as cash. 95 to 99 percent of all Métis script that was issued to Métis people was lost or swindled in one fashion or another that would be considered fraudulent under current laws. This slide shows one of many um, roadside allowance communities. The roadside allowance period, roughly 1900, to 1960 began when immigrant farmers claimed land in the prairie provinces after the 1885 northwest resistance many metis dispersed to parkland and forested regions others squatted on crown land intended for roads in rural areas or on other marginal pieces of land as a result the metis began to be called the road allowance people as they settled in dozens of makeshift communities a Michif scholar said, the Métis came to stay on these road allowances after they were dispossessed of their land through scrip. Road allowance communities popped up in areas where there was temporary employment. The homes were small, uninsulated, and built with scrap materials. The Métis worked for farmers picking rocks and roots, clearing trees, and doing other labor jobs. They were paid minimal wages or were paid with bits of food such as chicken, pork, or beef. As a result, they could not afford to buy their own homes or pay rent. Many families picked and sold Seneca root to sell. They picked berries, grew gardens, and trapped and hunted. But in ni by 1939, hunting required a license. Often Métis were jailed or fined for hunting food to survive. As hunting and fishing regulations increased and government work projects failed, more Métis turned to government aid to support, aid to support themselves. Métis were marginalized by a racist society. Road allowance people could not send their children to school because parents did not pay property taxes, costing three generations a basic education. The Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Act in 1935 forced many Métis out of their communities as they created community pastures. In places like Little Chicago near Lestock, Saskatchewan, road allowance Métis families were forcibly removed. Public pressure to address the road allowance problems led the Saskatchewan government to create Métis farms, colonies and schools but these were shut down in the mid-1950s. Despite these ongoing problems, many make tea focused on the good. Dance parties, visiting, helping each other out, and teaching their culture to the children were ways that they created a rich life while living in poverty. In the Second World War, many First Nations and Métis, men and women, joined the armed forces. They were considered equals. When they returned home, First Nations veterans were restricted to reserves and the Métis veterans were marginalized citizens. 
It is believed that the returning veterans played a role in the inclusion of Métis children in the education system and began the process of changing the Indian Act.